Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to all of you. This is uh, part of our um, global COVID dialogue series. Welcome. And um, um, we have uh, two great uh, panelists today. Uh, before I introduce them, I just wanted to uh, just very quickly talk about the topic today. We're going to be talking about resilience. Um, as you know, over the past few months, uh, in these uh, COVID dialogues, we have covered many clinical topics, uh, many management topics. But in my mind, the most fundamental uh, determinant of success of this long fight is the resilience of both individuals and the resilience of the system. And um, you know how do we um, how do we make our ourselves our colleagues resilient in the face of this crisis, and through that, how do we make the systems we work in uh, more resilient? So um, uh, I reached out to um, uh, two of my colleagues, um, Professor uh, Dr. Murad Khan. Uh, he is uh, the um, uh, well my mentor, my teacher for a long time, but. Um, Currently, he's a professor emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry at the Aga Khan University in Pakistan. He's also the president of the International Federation, uh, International Association for uh, Suicide Prevention, excuse me. And then I have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin uh, Chira. He's a system professor uh, and an emergency physician, uh, a leading emergency department at the Aga Khan University in Kenya. Uh, he is also the president of the African Federation for Emergency Medicine. So we have really two very uh, insightful, learned people. Uh, uh, Dr. Murad comes from a mental health background. And of course, uh, Ben is going to be uh, presenting from uh, or discussing from the frontline healthcare worker um, perspective. So without much ado, let me uh, request uh, Dr. Murad uh, to uh, share his thoughts on the resilience and then we'll go to Ben Yu. And then we will open it up uh, for discussion uh, and dialogue with the, uh, with the participants. So Dr. Murad. Thank you, Janet. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. I've been attending uh, quite a few of, of the webinars you've been doing and uh, the topics you've covered. And uh, I'm glad you've uh, chosen this topic because I, like you said, it is a very important topic and one that is um, you know, frequently overlooked. Um, so I'm, I'm particularly pleased that you, you've uh, uh, chosen this. So I'm just going to make a very brief presentation to set the stage of what uh, resilience is. And then we can go into the discussion and perhaps if we have time, I could talk a little bit about, again, a brief presentation on uh, building resilience at the individual and, and at the institutional level. Um, so let me start by, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, okay. So when this uh, pandemic started, uh, you know, everyone was kind of taken uh, by surprise and people took a long time to warm up and to understand what was happening. Um, and the frontline staff, the uh, right from the people, the paramedical staff, the ambulance drivers, the ED physicians, as well as the frontline physicians in the in the medical wards, in the ICU, and so on, they 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 were all affected. And suddenly, I read this uh, towards the end of April about this ER doctor in the U.S. in Manhattan who died by suicide, and uh, it was big news uh, at that time, and. As someone who has been studying suicide for a long time, I was quite taken aback. Um, I was taken aback um, and because 
you know, th this was not an inexperienced physician. She was quite experienced. She had no history of mental illness. Um, she did contract uh, COVID herself and she was at home. She recovered, she didn't need to be hospitalized. She went back to work uh, after a week and a half, but was sent home by the, by the hospital because it was felt that she was not fully fit. Um, and a father who himself was a physician um, noted these things about her as she was talking to him, that she was overwhelmed by the cases uh, because of the scenes that she was say, seeing in, in the wards and when the patients were coming in, um, what they were going through, how difficult it was for them to, to cope with the condition of breathing and looking very desperate. And she also noticed that some patients were actually dying before they were even taken out of the ambulances. And this really, when the cases were really mounting up in hospital, they're getting overwhelmed. Towards the end, a day or so before she died by suicide, her father noted that she seemed very detached. And this is all I've picked up from what was reported in the newspapers, that she seemed detached. And he, at, at that point, thought there was something wrong. But unfortunately, he did not take any action at that time. And to me, you know, looking at this and reading about this story for, from a distance, uh, some of the questions that came to my mind was that, how could such an experienced doctor um, take such an extreme step, even given the gravity of the situation and the, and the extreme uh, condition that she must have been uh, present in. And obviously she wasn't working on her own, she must have a whole team and, uh, there must have been other people uh, who were working with her. So I, I was quite stunned by this, uh, by this news. I also thought that because she was a recent uh, survivor of the COVID herself, could, could, a, uh, could a system, not just the immune system, but even mentally, do you think she was weakened and therefore she was not able to cope? Um, and if she was more resilient that we're going to be talking about, do you think she could have survived? And the big question, obviously, in every suicide one has to ask uh, when you investigate suicide is, was the death preventable or not? Now, we know that vast majority of suicides are preventable if, if steps are taken beforehand, systems are in place, uh, although some of them may not be totally preventable, but the vast majority are. And that's the kind of the premise that uh, all of us who work in suicide prevention work. So this, this was a big question. A healthcare professional, many years of experience, uh, working in a team, in a healthcare setting, um, despite all the, all the odds of, of dealing with these really um, difficult cases and the difficult situation, could she have been, uh, death have been prevented? And yes, I, I would say yes, definitely it was preventable. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't because the systems were not in place. Um, and so the big question is how could they have been prevented? How could it have been prevented? And resilience is only one of the aspects that works maybe at an individual level, but we also need to have a wider picture of resilience as a, at an institutional, at the systems level, and then perhaps at a societal level. So uh, coming to the definition of resilience, it is a process by which uh, when an individual uh, is faced with any kind of adversity, uh, a trauma or a tragedy, how do they respond to that? And, and, there is, and, and if they are able to adapt to it and respond well, then it is said that they have adequate resilience and therefore they'll be able to withstand the, the trauma or the tragedy. Now, it could be anything like the pandemic we're facing now, but it could be other things also, relationship problems, um, personal health problems, uh, problems in the workplace, financial stresses, as we will be seeing now as a socioeconomic impact of the pandemic now plays out in the coming weeks and months. So all of these things uh, um, challenge us to, to deal with them. Uh, resilient individuals are the one who do face these adversities head on, they take them as a challenge, they deal with it, they do not get overwhelmed, they do not break down. And through uh, addressing this, this uh, uh, adverse circumstances, they're able to then maneuver themselves. They can change course, they, they can uh, keep themselves intact, they can heal emotionally as well, and they keep moving towards the goals, whatever the goals may be. They don't stop, they don't break down, they don't go back. Uh, 
it is also seen through research that individuals who are resilient do not ex experience as, as much uh, um, and mental health problems, but it doesn't mean that they experience less distress, grief, or anxiety. They do as any other person, but it's their ability to respond to this um, distress and the trauma that differentiates the resilient individuals from those who are not so resilient. And in many cases, people who are resilient, who can face this kind of adversity without breaking down, actually emerge much stronger, both psychologically, emotionally, and even spiritually. And this is uh, known as post-traumatic growth, that uh, even in a very trying uh, situation or trying circumstances, people can actually use that to become better. Sometimes people may not do it by design, but their ability to deal with that in a, in a meaningful way, in a constructive and a positive way, actually makes them much stronger. And that is what is called post-traumatic growth. On the other hand, um, individuals who are less resilient uh, for various reasons, and we can discuss that later, they become more overwhelmed, they dwell on the problems, they kind of get stuck, and some of them may resort to unhealthy and at times dangerous behaviors like, for example, falling into uh, drug abuse, uh, alcoholism, um, violence, um, or taking, uh, indulging in risk-taking behaviors. Uh, they are much more slower to recover from these setbacks. They take much longer time. And they certainly experience much more psychological distress. Now, some of the factors that contribute to resilience, um, some people are perhaps naturally resilient. It doesn't seem to be affected by adversity so much. And they, and they, and they let everything slide off them. They're able to deal with these things. And we know of individuals like that. And we also know of individuals who just break down even with, with the smallest uh, of, of, uh, and, uh, of a difficult situation. The good thing is that it can be learned. You can actually learn what are the steps to become more resilient. Uh, one of the things that is extremely critical is social support. So people who are under stress or faced with adversity, they tend to isolate themselves. And the presence of social support can really act as, as a facilitator of helping people deal with whatever they have. Uh, some of the other traits that have been found in resilient individuals are these individuals have more positive view of themselves and of the world. So they're kind of more hopeful. Um, they have a realistic view of their abilities. They make realistic plans. They follow them through. They don't kind of leave them um, unattended. They have excellent communication skills. So they're able to communicate their distress or ask for help. Um, and they can open up as opposed to those who kind of shut up, shut themselves uh, away from everyone else and become isolated. Re uh, resilient individuals see challenges, uh, see um, uh, situations as challenges and adverse situations as a challenge to meet them and to do the best as opposed to seeing themselves as a victim that I can't do anything and they become paralyzed. Resilient individuals also have what is called high emotional quotient or emotional intelligence. So th these are people who um, who can regulate their emotions. They, they they don't they're not reactive. They are calmer. They assess the situation, and they they're able to um, communicate and ask for help if needed. Uh, so these are people with high emotional intelligence, and they have what is called an internal locus of control. The so locus of control is: Do you see situations? Um, uh, something in your control or do you feel a victim that there are things in the external world that is making you do these things? So those who have an external uh, locus of control tend to blame everyone else. They don't see what they could have done to either not be in that situation or to deal with that. But people who see the external locus of control as outside of themselves always blame other people for, for their situation. The more you have an internal local locus of control, um, even, if, even if you are in a situation like we have nowadays, the better you are able to respond and the better uh, resilient uh, level you have. The good thing is again, like in, in learn uh, about resilience and how to become more resilient, you can also change an external locus of control to an internal one. But of course it requires practice, it requires Repetition requires consistency, 
if you're able to do that, if you're able to know how to change from an external to an internal and to get more control of the situation, you can actually improve your situation. One of the, I showed you about Dr. Lorna Breen, the lady who uh, died by suicide. An example of a resilient people, uh, person, and then many, many in, in, in history, is one, one that I really admire, uh, is Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. He was a Jew, a neurologist, and a psychiatrist from Austria. And he was um, sent to the concentration camp when the Nazis took over Germany. He lost his parents, he lost his brother, he lost his wife. Um, just before his wife was sent into concentration camp, she had a miscarriage, so he lost his um, infant child as well. But he survived. He survived the Holocaust, he came out and he started um, you know, writing about the experience and based on what he observed in the concentration camp, that even in that really difficult situation where you had absolutely no chance of, of uh, being free or being, being um, uh, uh, even to think, he was able to observe that people who, who, who tried to get the internal locus of control, even in those really desperate circumstances, were the ones who actually survived. And he wrote this book, Man's Search for Meaning, which I will really um, uh, advise everyone to really uh, read this. Uh, it's available on the net. Um, you can download it. It's a wonderful book. Um, and Viktor Frankl is the author. So I'll, I'll stop here and we can perhaps go into uh, discussion later on, come back to it. Thank you. Well, wow, thank you. <clears throat> this is so insightful and so relevant. Uh, let me uh, request uh, Ben, uh, you to uh, take on screen. Uh, yes, Junaid, how are you? Yeah, so very nice presentation, Beto Khan. And I think a lot of what he's presented upon is what uh, pretty much has been the guiding force on the ground here in terms of even at institutional level, um, a lot of the fears that we are seeing on the ground at individual level where people are actually quite... Um, so initially there was the fear uh, that people had for COVID-19 and um, the fear was fueled a lot of lack of information, not knowing what's next, what's going to happen. And um, as time went by, the anxiety grew. And some of the things that we've seen is um, people not being quite sure what's next, whether to, like, how to proceed. And this has significant impact, even at institutional level. And uh, building resilience, um, even at an institutional level, probably would start off with building resilience at individual levels because um, an institution is the people who work at the institution and not necessarily just at, at just the institution on its own. And um, I think um, the presentation by Dr. Khan is a good place to start looking at also our experiences on the ground um, about um, what we've seen happening. And it's... Um, as the whole COVID-19 situation is an evolving situation. And uh, some of the things we've learned, I can say I've learned personally working to build the resilience around the organization has been looking at, um, the, I think the most important part for me from my experience has been communication, um, clear communication, updating communication, regular communication, uh, consistent and um, just open discussion and open channels of communication. Um, a few instances I've seen where there's been bad communication um, and especially also leadership down to the people working on the ground, that communication went has not been handled well has probably contributed significantly to people not really feeling supported and not feeling, um, and potentially in some instances, people just breaking down and not or oh, increased uh, amounts of people being sick off, not wanting to come to the office, because they're not getting proper communication. So I think that's one of the biggest things um, I can say at national level that has been uh, quite interesting to watch how as the communication improves, the people's resilience and the people's ability to cope with the situation has improved significantly. I think that's one of the things we've seen uh, on the ground. Great, uh, yeah, thanks Ben. Uh, do you want to add anything more uh, or are you, for now you're done? 
Oh, sorry, I was just proposing to just check uh, for any reactions. But uh, beyond the communication, I think um, control, I don't know how effective maybe Dr. Khan can also elaborate in terms of a lot of times when people, um, when the resilience around, uh, when people have no resilience to cope with the situation, they tend to feel that they no longer have control of the situation. And this at a mass level, for example, at a situational level where everyone is feeling hopeless and uh, out of control, then they need to have proper structures that create that sense of control and get that sense of guidance. Um, for us, I mean, for me, what I can see is that we've seen that as the more organized the leadership is, the more in control the leadership is, has been, has contributed significantly to building resilience within the organization, because then people believe that they are part of a strategy that has clear leadership and clear direction. I don't know what, what Dr. Khan's um, experience with this would be. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Ben. It's, it's extremely important that uh, uh, there has to be, there should be a very clear uh, leadership. And one of the important traits of uh, good leadership really is good communication. It should be timely, it should be transparent, it should be frequent, and it should be honest. So th these are some of the things that, that are extremely important. I think we all know what a difficult situation this is. The science is evolving. There are many things that we don't know. And to, to communicate that to, to, the, to the employees um, and everyone else, I think is extremely important. So communication, I think, is the key. And um, following that, I think a very clear cut strategy should, should be in place, even given the fact that this is an evolving situation. So those I think are the two key things. Um, some of this could be preempted uh, and should be uh, in, in terms of, uh, for example, it, is, it should be known that the staff, particularly the frontline staff are going to be under a lot of stress. And to not have mechanisms in place to deal with that, but to allow them to continue till they reach a breaking point, I think is, is, uh, is, is ignoring some of these fundamental things that we do know. So I really feel it should be mandatory for all hospital staff, particularly those who are at the front line, to have debriefing sessions or, you know, at, at a very basic level, it should, could be some place where they can come and share their experiences. At a more advanced level, those who actually run into mental health issues, they probably will require what is called, you know, supportive group or group therapy and so on. But it, very few institutions are actually doing that. And they, they're focusing more on the physical aspects, which of course they have to, and this aspect is really being overlooked. I think, uh, and I agree with you, I think one of the things you've just mentioned that has been also practical in our situation is the part that it's an evolving situation and something that we have to just keep working on. Um, I remember just even just discussions on just basic donning and doffing or putting on PPEs, that message, no matter how many times you say it, it's just something that you just have to keep reinforcing the message. It's something you have to keep um, telling the same message over and over and over again. And that is what has helped um, pretty much um, help the staff cope a bit better and be more comfortable around the discussion. And But even now, every other day, we're still having discussions about which PPE should be worn where. But I, I think uh, with an evolving situation like we have at the moment, working, keep working on the resilience and continued uh, focus on building the resilience within the staff because um, initially, even when I was starting off, I thought would be, oh yeah, we just do it once in the beginning, tell people to toughen up, and then let, hopefully they will just survive. But uh, over time, we realize it's just something that has to be continuously, continuously uh, worked upon, and it's something that has to be always discussed and always brought forward. Um, and for example, at the institutional level, we have a psychosocial support uh, committee whose main focus is um, just dealing with staff, um, the psycho, the wellness of staff. And that committee initially used to meet quite often, then we broke it off a bit, and we thought we could actually do away with the committee initially. But it has become, again, it has been thrust to the forefront again um, to keep working because every new day there's something new that comes up. And 
keeping the staff motivated, um, and that's also something else, keeping the staff motivated and keeping having a positive attitude uh, coming to the office uh, is something that has required a lot of work um, to build the institutional structure, the institutional, to help the institutional cope best with COVID and make sure that the staff still maintain a positive attitude. And it's sad, for example, the, the doctor, the ER doctor from the US who committed suicide. And I'd hate to see any situation like that happen anywhere in the world, not just even where we work. And I think they need to be more done from the leadership perspective. And also, for example, forming those psychosocial support committees at institutional level to pretty much focus on, as you said, not the physical aspects of uh, the staff, but actually the mental well-being of the staff. And I think of all the committees that is now becoming quite an important one, even at our place, is the psychosocial committee. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We have a couple of questions, but before we go there, <clears throat> you know, uh, when this whole thing started, and I wanted to share my own experience, um, having dealt with many crises uh, over my career, um, I was like, you know, this is just another one. We'll lead with it. Um, and at that time, very early on, I started working on the uh, predicting predictive models for the uh, frontline healthcare workers' mortality. <clears throat> and I got so absorbed in this and started thinking about it, sort of, um, and wanted to finish that project, that before I knew I was like getting extremely anxious and my family started noticing it as well. So what's going on? Why, you know, why are you so impacted by all of this? And I said, you know, because maybe I'm so close to it, now I sort of, perhaps see some of uh, my colleagues may not make it. You know, and I don't know how much, what is it real and how much was it in my mind. And having this resistance of seeking help when you have all of this going on and you know, you're always in door to toughen up, as you said, Ben. Um, and you know, frankly, I didn't reach out to anybody except you know, till one of my colleagues, um, wrote to me and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, somebody from the Department of Psychiatry at Hopkins. Uh, and um, my initial response was, oh, everything is fine. But then I wrote a couple of more lines and she called me and she said, you know, what's going on? So we talked about this <clears throat> and um, that um, led to um, us creating a faculty support group in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Now, I, I chaired the wellness committee in my department, so you know I probably was more sensitive to that already. And having that experience now of, of being part of this wellness group uh, and now with this um, support group that is being supported or, or coordinated by one of the faculty psychiatry has been immensely helpful. But it is still not really picked up. We have about 70 faculty members. I think maybe 10 to 15 people actually attended and others either don't think it's important or, or they don't find it is the right format. And the reason I'm saying it is because, you know, coming out as a, as a weak sort of weak person and, and talking about your own vulnerabilities is, uh, is so important. And as you grow older, I guess you get more open to that. Uh, the other thing that, you know, I keep thinking about is this whole area of uh, uh, post-traumatic growth versus burnout, you know. In my mind, it is you can either grow or you can burn out. And burnout is a huge issue already in our field. Um, for, for people working in the emergency department, 50, 60, 70 percent people are burnt out. So in that situation, um, how do you take people who are already burnt out, have relatively limited resilience to begin with, and start building on it when you have a crisis like this? So maybe Dr. Murad, you can, uh, I can request you to just comment on perhaps the individual response, but also, as I mentioned, the institutional response through these uh, groups and, and, uh, and support mechanisms. So an important, uh point, uh, Junaid. Um, it's very important to 
identify people if one can, and then to offer help um, as, as required. Now, it is not easy to identify people. People don't come up because of the reasons you have elaborated. It's considered as a sign of weakness. Uh, medicine um, is, is an area that in which we are supposed to be tough. We are supposed to deal with uh, all sorts of situations, life and death situations, and not react. But uh, institutions really have to look at this differently, that, that these are human beings, and they may have different levels of resilience and, um, and ability to withstand stress, but we all have a breaking point. Now, some, some might cope much better in certain situations. Others may not uh, cope so much better. For example, if, if one is treating, say, um, a female patient who is of a certain age and that physician may have maybe lost his mother recently, and that person might have difficulty in dealing with that situation. So knowing what this person is going through is extremely important. Um, now, we all have this situation in, in the pandemic where it is not just us, but the fear of taking the, the virus and, and, and passing it on to our family members if we have um, you know, spouses or children or even elderly parents. Now, we need to really go down to that level to find out what are the living circumstances of the people who, who are our employees. Where are they going when they go back home? Do they have enough space to isolate themselves? Are they able to, do they have enough water, for example, to take a bath, to wash the clothes? And we know how difficult the situation is in, in Karachi and in Pakistan generally. So institutions need to build in these things. Uh, and the way to do that is to really communicate and to ask them. And through that, if you're able to identify the more vulnerable individual, then you offer the kind of help and support that they require. It will be a very small number who will require that because the majority of them actually are doing okay and will do okay, as in any catastrophe or, or a situation. This is slightly different because it is ongoing. So every department, every section should identify people uh, if they are vulnerable, uh, according to whatever metrics you come up with, then offer the kind of help and support that they require. And I think that's an institutional responsibility. Now, you know, going back to that case that I showed you of Dr. Breen, obviously, you know, people were dealing with this ongoing crisis and no one had the time to look at the, what uh, individuals are going through. But if you have uh, a system in place whereby people can come and share and express, they have adequate time uh, off, they, they're able to, they're, they're able to uh, recover and so on, it's quite possible that um, what she was going through could have been picked up, and she would have, she would have, um, she would have been given the help that that was required. And that's why I feel um, it was a unnecessary suicide. It could have been prevented. Sorry, uh, I'll take uh, the two questions that we have from the participants, and please, uh, everybody, uh, please feel free to write to us. So um, um, Dr. Murad uh, Dilshah Dashraf, uh, she is uh, from the IED uh, at AKU. And she's asking um, your views about how to build a collective resilience in situation like COVID-19. So Dilshad, again, I would reiterate what I said earlier about institution, institution leadership of communication, which should be honest, which should be clear, which should be transparent, should be timely. I think you need to do that at, at a much wider level. Uh, at, an, at, a, at a national level, it's extremely important that we have behavioral scientists who should, who should come up with messages that will, that will be applicable to these different sections of, of the people. We use the term social distancing and we use the term of how to, um, how to isolate yourself. You know, the people who have large houses um, in defense in Clifton and Karachi, for example, are in a very different situation than those in Kachi Abadis who are living in, in maybe one room or two rooms and have about 10 or 12 family members. So the kind of messaging you have to give should be targeted, it should be relevant, it should be culturally appropriate and should be in such simple language that it, it, should, uh, it should make sense to the people who are watching this on television and so on. So 
I mean, this, this is how you do that. I mean, this is the general framework. Communication is the key in, in a situation like this. You have to be consistent and you, you've got to communicate uh, frequently and, and be honest and tell them what is happening. So uh, data, uh, data is extremely important. Nowadays, some countries may be hiding the data and not showing the results. In the UK, for example, they were only counting the deaths that were happening in the hospital, while a large number of their uh, elderly were dying in the nursing homes. And then, you know, six weeks down the line, people started questioning this. And then they started um, including those numbers of people dying in the care homes, and suddenly the numbers went up. So whether they were doing it by design or whether they overlooked it, I don't know. But the fact is that the more honest you are, with, with your uh, people, with the population, the better chances you have of people cooperating with you. Yeah, so the next question, uh, Ben, I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, respond is about the right level, uh, you know, the, how do you maintain communication so that there's a right level of anxiety, but not too high for people to become um, paralyzed? Now, in Pakistan and in many other countries, and in the US, as you know, a lot of people did not believe this is a real issue, uh, did not think it is a serious enough issue for us to change our lifestyles. And then there were other people who were just extremely ex uh, concerned and, and, and wanted to do stuff about it. So uh, from Gilgit, um, we, we hear that people over there think that it is, most people are recovering, which is absolutely right. How do you how do you uh, communicate so that you can you can talk about the real issues without without taking away the power to act actually actually allowing people to act so that they are um, they're doing the right thing and not getting paralyzed or on the other extreme not ignore uh, the, what needs to be done. Um, thanks, United, for that, and thanks for the question from the uh, from the team watching. I think actually that was one of the biggest problems, and still remains a big problem here in terms of there are two levels of communication that there. One of it is very alarmist um, in the sense that we're all gonna die. Um, it's just a matter of time, and then then there's the reality where people are watching on, are watching outside and saying, well. I've not really seen anyone die. So this thing must be, well, it's not that bad. It's not that real. And getting that sweet spot in the middle where people need to be well, uh, con concerned enough to take care, but also not, as you said, not too worried and not too panicked to a level where they're not able to work. Um, and a lot of it then boils down to still, again, on communication and especially at hospital level um, for people to actually be able to, A, number one, understand, for example, how many patients are coming through the hospital, what's the condition of these patients, how many patients have deteriorated uh, to the point where maybe they've uh, been quite serious or they've passed on, and correlating this with the reality on the ground and just keeping, keeping, keeping the information as real as it is without really, so yes, the numbers are going up, a lot of it is community spread, and true enough, not everyone who gets COVID will, will die, but there is uh, those population who are at significant risk, for example, and this is um, of those elderly with comorbid conditions, but even the young people still need to be careful enough. And there's a certain level of carefulness that needs to go um, across board, uh, whether you are at home or whether you are at the office or even the hospital, that just uh, basics, hand washing, wearing a mask, uh, keeping some distance between you uh, people. So it's being able to provide communication that's more real than and more to, to at the level in which the person get together in this communication is can relate to. So again, it's so it has to be to some level contextualized. So. If we say, for example, and we announce every day at the hospital, for example, that, oh, there are 3,000 cases, um, actually there are 16,000 cases of COVID, at, and as part of our daily briefs every day in the hospital, then people will be very panicked because, well, 16,000 people in the hospital of 300 beds is a bit panicky. But the reality of which is majority of the people who come are not actually at the hospital. So we are handling the situation, and the people coming in at numbers that 
we actually are comfortably being able to handle. And majority of the staff uh, who are the front line are every day coming to the office and handling the staff perfectly well. And we are able to control and to avoid actually any hostel acquired infection. So we are doing it and we're doing it well so far. And this is built communicating this to the staff, then there's a bit more confidence in the staff about the whole situation, at least in terms of just coming to the office and coming to work to be able to continue working. But also, we still need them to be very careful when they go back to their homes to be able to make sure that they are still maintaining the same measures back home that they do um, at the hospital um, to make sure that, again, they're not at risk of contracting the disease in their neighborhoods, in their homes. And the reality of which, and again, so the messaging again, and I've seen some potentially not very good messaging where it's really alarmist that everyone will die, but people need to understand that the disease is there, not everyone will die, and people still need to be careful. And those who contract the disease have a higher chance of surviving than dying. Um, and even those who get severely ill, there is supportive measures that be put in place. And even they have a very good uh, fighting chance in terms of survival. So it's all about how it's communicated and making sure that all misconceptions, all uh, rumors are corrected early to, make, to prevent them becoming ingrained as part of the communication uh, that goes around. Thanks. One of the, uh, one of the questions I am trying to figure out an answer to is, to me, it seems like resilience um, and communication are skills that are essential. They are as essential as teaching our residents and faculty on how to intubate, how to take care of patients. Um, and perhaps more uh, because it really impacts your career. How can we teach this? Is there, is there a workshop, is there a course that we can mandate, we are leaders in our own little environment. Can we create something like, does something like that exist already, Dr. Murat? Yes, absolutely, Janelle. I think uh, communica communication uh, skills is taught to medical students. Uh, it is extremely vital, uh, as you know, for all physicians. I mean, the main complaint that patients have um, from the medical profession is uh, mostly based on poor communication, whether it's uh, you know something going wrong or something not being imparted. So it's malcommunication, miscommunication is really the basis. So communication skills, good medical schools pay a lot of emphasis on teaching communication skills to your students, and and uh, but there are many others that that need to develop that. So yes, it is available. And similarly for resilience. Um, maybe not so much now, uh, maybe not so much as communication skills, because it's kind of expected that people will just pick that up. But like many things, these really have to be addressed very actively. So I agree with you. Um, uh, as far as building resilience is concerned, uh, they have to be much more proactive approach uh, by institutions for their uh, staff, um, particularly in healthcare, because we're dealing with such difficult situations all the time. So yes. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, what, what I meant by communication is you know, this is such an unprecedented situation. Leaders really don't know what to do. They have never trained, uh, never really thought about there will be a situation where there's going to be a continuous need for communication with very little information and very little to really offer in many cases. Uh, so that that is one. But in terms of building resilience, if we have to come up with a two, three hour training, you know, based on what you just talked about, do you think that would be effective? Should that be offered to people who are going out and doing these things on the front line? Absolutely. Um, you know, building resilience requires you to do things at an individual level, how to build up your physical resilience and how to build up your emotional resilience. And there are elements to both of these things. And, and then how do you incorporate that at the systems level so that institutions become more resilient? Um, institutions are made by individuals. And I think if individuals are able to practice that uh, at all levels, 
then uh, the culture of the institution can can actually change and 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 it's imperative i think good institutions should really be investing in this uh, looking at and uh, looking at the health of of the employees we know that that uh, uh, when the internal customer your employees are emotionally or physically unwell then your processes suffer your your work suffers uh, and if you're able to invest there um, and uh, re building resilience is really part of making uh, people much more much more uh, fit both emotionally and physically so that they can perform the tasks better so yes i mean it's and I'm, i don't agree it's, it's a one off two to three hour workshop it is something that has to be ongoing it it is uh, it is it should be reinforced periodically like you know we have refreshers for cpr and uh, als and dls we just don't do it once and then leave the uh, person so it has to be you know treated in the same way and that's how you can become more resilient great we have a couple of questions that I, i want to give last 5 uh, 7 minutes dr murad back to you because i know you have something else to to present um there is a question um i guess we have already addressed that so for dr murad thank you for the pointers even though these are specific there are specific in discussion for healthcare workers a lot of it is applicable to those not in the medical field aside from organization level initiatives and support that folks can receive what recommendations suggestions do you have for individual they can practice at personal level to improve their own resilience so very quickly I, the principles of stress management really apply here and for stress management there are few things that and i'm i'm just going to be very brief and you can go on the net and look for them you, the three things that you really need to focus on is diet exercise and sleep these are natural things these are simple things that we all should practice um and you should have a healthy diet keep a weight down calculate your bmi and stay within your bmi anyone who's over 21 22 bmi is running into problems cut it down and how do you cut it down by eating diets go on the net and look at how do you cut it down very generally we eat too much sugar and we eat too much meat and carbs cut it down if you live in pakistan you have abundance of vegetables and fruits and focus on that become a vegetarian as as i have become a few years ago this uh, second thing is sleep you must get 7 to 9 hours of sleep which is uninterrupted i know in karachi with with the electricity blackout it's it's quite a challenge but under normal circumstances you should you should be getting that kind of sleep uh, without the aid of any kind of medications again i know some people take medication they can't do without it but the vast majority should not take any medication the third thing is exercise please exercise every day 50 minutes brisk walking jogging any kind of sports it will help you sleep it will keep your weight down and you'll generally feel well we know that so that is really at an individual level practice some form of spirituality it's very important to not be caught up in this materialistic world and look for things outside yourself have a support system encourage friends friendship have one or two or three good friends you can share your your you know deepest uh, uh, wishes with uh, your concerns and so on you, you must cultivate friendship that's very important read as much as you can like you should exercise you should read reading is the best mental exercise please not just what is happening nowadays but books biographies history current affairs whatever you can so reading is extremely extremely important if you are able to follow these things um Uh, and and find a balance between all of these aspects of one's life your professional life your family life your personal life uh, you would probably be all right and that's how you become resilient in the process great uh thank you and and thanks ben for responding to the question online uh dr murad do you want to uh, talk about uh, what you have planned before So I just wanted to share a little bit about institutional resilience we've talked about individual resilience and uh, and very quickly is just a short presentation so as the as the person had asked the question Uh, just elaborating on that i've i've addressed some of these so 
healthy relationships, relationships that are non-judgmental, that are non-critical, try and cultivate that. Take care of your body on the principle that I've just described. Having a positive outlook is always, is always uh, helpful. Uh, the example I give is, uh, is of a glass half full or half empty. Uh, try and look at the half full and, and uh, what you can do to build on this and find a meaning in your life. I think it's important. And one of the ways you can do that is to you know, help others who are worse off than you. And if you do run into problems of any sort, then seek help. Uh, and I mean psychological help. Now, institutions also are affected by resiliency levels. And a resilient institution is one that really invests in systems and processes. Okay, the better systems and processes you have, the more well-established they are, the better you'll be able to deal with uh, issues. And one of the important fundamental thing is, things is that systems and processes must be embedded in ethics and integrity. We have systems, but they perhaps do not go to that level of where they are really, really looking at uh, ethics. And ethics is really what? Ethics is doing the right thing. So there are many institutions that are rules-based, they do things right. They have protocols and guidelines and policies. And so they do things right. But ethics goes beyond that. And ethics-based organizations are those who not only do things right, but they also do the right thing, irrespective of uh, what may happen, irrespective of the bad publicity or the financial loss uh, and so on. Because in the long term, this is what really establishes your credibility. It's very important, and I want to share this, what is called an ethics iceberg. And this is really related to institutional resilience and institutional culture. That on the, on the surface above the iceberg, we have what are called, what are the decisions and actions that affect us as individuals. Uh, just below the surface are the systems and processes that drive the decisions and actions. But deep below, right at the bottom, hidden from the view, is the environment and culture of an institution. And this is the critical thing that uh, affects your systems and processes that leads to decision, decision making that, that we then all follow. So studying the environment and culture is the most critical thing. If you want to change that, you've got to study the kind of culture we have in our institution. And then this um, uh, second step is really how to change that culture. One of the critical things about um, organizational culture and uh, ethical organizations is the role of leadership. And ethical leadership is activities on the part of leaders to foster an environment and culture that support ethical practices throughout the organization. So to really understand what ethics is, how can you weave ethical practices into your systems and processes so that people are not just doing things right, but they're also doing the right thing is really critical. And this comes from the leadership. Because unlike many things that are bottoms up, I think leadership has to really flow from top to down. It has to, be, it has to begin at a strategic level and then it must flow down so that it permeates all levels. And it's really crucial to the ethical behavior and culture of an organization. And this is how many organizations suffer because they do not have an ethical uh, culture. And what employees require from the leaders is not how clever they are or the kind of vision that they, they, they uh, profess or the creativity. What they really need is the basic principles of honesty, of integrity, of caring and ethics. This is what most employees uh, require of other people, of the leaders. One of the important things is that we should not just presume that ethics will just somehow get established in organization. We are doing things according to certain policies and everything will be, will be right. No, it doesn't. Ethics has to be actively managed because organization is, is a very diverse set of uh, people, with different values, different motives. And the only thing that can, that can really balance out these different uh, ideas is really ethics. And the way to do that is through an organizational program. Very few organizations um, in, in, um, in the world um, have an overarching organizational ethics program. They have committees. They may have a bioethics committee, they may have a hospital ethics committee, and, and uh, maybe a, a research ethics committee and so on. They do not have an overarching organizational ethics program. And this is one of the most critical things 
that they have that that should be there and the one of the best um, ethics program is the in integrated ethics program of the VA health system in the US and despite that even that organization ran into problems some years ago and still is but as 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 a, as a system and as a program that they have one of the best and anyone who's really interested in that should really study the integrated ethics program of the VA health system of the US so I'll just stop there thanks very much this, this is wonderful, uh, Dr. Murad. <clears throat> Do you know, <clears throat> looking at, uh, let me get back to one more point. Looking at the leadership of the countries and looking at the kind of messaging they're coming out and the trust people have on their leaders at the, at the national levels. In. And then um, um, that sometimes translate into how institutions respond how do you how, how can you be an institution sort of surviving surrounded by practices which are not very ethical and sustain yourself you know is that is that a real problem or you think that is more of you know just a way to get out of hard decision making no, I think it's a real problem. And I think uh, what's happening in the world today, countries who have been successful, as you know, are, are the countries who have a more, much more compassionate and an ethical leadership. And we all know those countries. Um, and uh, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, most of these countries are led by women. So, uh, and these are really good examples in, in leadership. Um, and those who have really taken the leadership and those who are really failing so I think one of the things that will happen in the post-pandemic world is the whole concept of uh, global leadership is, is probably going to change from what we thought of to what it's going to be. Institutions who, uh, that function in societies that have very uh, challenging governance structures that are highly corrupt and so on have a much more greater responsibility because they become the role models. And so they really have to do a couple of things. They must take on the responsibility of being a role model for the others, but they must also be a bulwark to not allow these corrupt practices to come in there into the institution. And the way for them to stop that from seeping into their own institutions is to really what I've talked about, is to build systems and processes and, and anchor them in integrity and ethics. If you're able to strengthen that, and obviously you will be challenged all the time, if you're able to stick to that over a period of time, you will definitely become not just a role model, but you'll have uh, credibility that will, uh, that will really establish you. So I think it is, it is very important. We've got to really invest in, ethic, uh, in systems and processes, but it should be ethics driven, not only financial, financially driven, not only should be um, legally uh, vetted, but also ethically vetted. Great, thanks. Uh, we are at the uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, ben, any last uh, thoughts before we close? Um, I think, um, thank you very much for the great presentation, Dr. Sakan. And I think the key message for me from this whole thing mm -hmm. still boils down to uh, improving communication and also this being driven mainly from the leadership perspective. And I like the last slides about ethical leadership and which will of course drive then to better levels of communication, transparency, and the realities um, being uh, coming on other uh, races on the ground, being communicated effectively by the leadership and everyone working together to build resilience amongst the staff as individuals, but also uh, along amongst, uh, within the organization, because uh, that's the only way that we'll be able to tackle this whole pandemic collectively. You know, I can't uh, let this go. Uh, this is from Rosina Kamliani, uh, Dr. Murad, uh, gender and uh, ethical leadership. You want to take that on? I think gender and compassionate leadership, definitely. I think women leaders uh, on the whole are certainly much more caring and much more compassionate. And by compassion, I mean the ability to recognize the suffering of others, but also then take the step to relieve that suffering, not just sit there and feel sorry, but to actually go beyond that. So I really feel uh, women leaders definitely have that trait much more developed than the men leaders. Uh, by and large, um, whether they're ethical or not, 
I think if someone is compassionate, I think they will become ethical also doing the right thing. And uh, I really feel we must have more uh, uh, women leaders, not just in institutions, but also around the world. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, th and thank you uh, to all the participants. Uh, we are two minutes uh, over time. Uh, this is going to be, rec this is recorded, should be available online uh, very soon. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you guys again in the next couple of weeks. Thank, thank you. you very much, Junaid. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.